uh, cover all of that information, I hope, in a recap after this is done. Um, nobody reminded me to turn on recording. Um, however, my system is acting slow, which made me think that we were actually recording. Um, regardless, I am going to unpresent. And uh, we have... Let's see, coming to the four, we have uh, 0019A sharp. So if you guys, if you uh, while he's doing that, if you guys want to want to pop over to the to the document, and you are invited to the stage, Prasant. What I'm going to do as we go along is I will time you for, I'm going to start a timer. Uh, I'll set, I'll have the timer go for um, 10 minutes, um, which will be kind of your, your time to, to, to start thinking about, you know, wrapping it up. Uh, I won't cut you off at that point, um, but please try to, you know, try to wrap it up in the next two to five minutes at that point. Um, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so my name is Prasant, and my project for open source software. I figure it's about two thirds of the way through, so that should be a pretty good, a pretty good, uh, pretty good way to go. And hopefully, we'll get through at least six today, and uh, and then we will go on from there. Take it away, Prasant. All right. I can't so, hear you yet, yeah, by the way. Just so. Oh. You're aware. Uh, uh, can you hear me now? Oh, okay. Uh, apparently, everybody else can. Um, all right, I think I can still just go then. Um, so my name is Prasant. Everybody but me can hear you, huh? That is yeah, funky. Oh, I know what's going on. My bad. My bad. Give me just a second. Okay, please go ahead now. Okay. Um, so my name is Prasant. And my project is Miso. Uh, I'm the only one who's I'm the only one in the class who was working on this project. Um, also, I'd like to apologize if you hear any lawnmower sounds in the background. Uh, that's just my neighbors. So, um, actually, I'll give you guys a second to just copy that down. All right. So what is MISO? Well, in uh, the way the project was originally designed, uh, it's supposed to act kind of like YouTube DL for graphic novels. So if you don't know what YouTube DL is, it's basically a command line utility um, where you would like um, type in YouTube DL and then you can paste in a link to a YouTube video and it would basically download it for you. Uh, it also has some other things, like, for example, you can choose what quality you want to download it in. Uh, you can also choose what formats and things like that, and you would provide those through command line arguments. Uh, and it's also more of a general purpose sort of downloader and archiver. So you can use more sites than just YouTube. Um, and the reason why I wanted uh, to do this sort of project is because I went looking around, and there wasn't really anything like it for graphic novels in particular. And I kind of like uh, over winter break, I'd kind of gotten into reading them. So I decided to make the project. So originally, uh, we had a few goals. So when I started in about like March for open source software, I already had some code. Uh, I'd written a little script that would basically um, grab uh, and download some images from a site they uh, had no uh, front-facing API where they would show you like where uh, their material was coming from, and you can just download it from that. Um, but it was essentially just like uh, when I started, it was basically just like a JavaScript file that just like grabbed some stuff. So I decided to try and reorganize the code base and also add a lot more sites that uh, could be downloaded from. Another um, uh, goal was to also add different download options, right? So Besides from just like PDFs, there was also I also wanted like if you wanted individual images, 
uh, if you wanted different file formats, like uh, there's a format called uh, .cbz and cbr, uh, which are essentially just like um, RAR files that can be read uh, one by one. So, um, and also uh, the final one was to add a command line interface. Um, so those were the sort of goals for the project. In terms of organization, um, first it's set up as a blessed repository. So if I go over here, you can see that uh, there's one fork and the only fork is me. Um, but basically it was set up so that way um, you would fork the repo, make your changes, and then make a pull request. And we would review it, pull it in, and then um, and then uh, it would be put into the main repository. And the main reason why is because I wanted it to be that um, there would be a central of like files, basically, that um, you could use for like a lot of different uh, sites. But each of the sites that you would scrape from, they'd be kind of separated in their own sort of files. So I felt that, well, that's pretty modular, I guess, and you can use it for a lot of different things. So in that sense, it makes sense to kind of fork the repo, make your own changes for personal use anyway. So I thought it would, um, if that was the main method of contribution, I think that would like synergize very well. So that was the main reason for going with a blessed repository. Uh, and similarly, I also went with an MIT license because it was very permissive. Um, since it would be uh, for like basically similar reasons. Another thing is uh, I created an issue template as well. So I don't know if you guys can see that. Uh, I include like a little snapshot of what it would look like. So you would tick off if you had like a particular sort of issue. So if you had a bug report, if you wanted a feature to be added, or if a site recommend a site, re a site recommendation, or if it was a miscellaneous feature, you would tick it off. And then kind of follow the instructions for what the issue is and uh, elsewise. So that was mostly just like an organization thing. Unfortunately, the issues didn't really get uh, used all that often. And the reason why is because uh, I had a few people who, um, outside of uh, open source software, who wanted to try to contribute. But they didn't end up really doing that much overall. Uh, they had other things to do. So it ended up just being me. Um, doing the project, so it didn't really make sense to leave an issue and then immediately go set up out working it, make a pull request addressing the issue. It seemed kind of silly. Um, so more about a uh, project organization. We also have um, in the wiki um, guidelines for how to contribute. So you know, fork the repo, follow the build instructions. Uh, the build instructions would be located in the readme and write the code, commit, uh, et cetera. For methods of communication, that's also in the wiki. Um, it's a Discord link. The code of conduct as well is in the wiki. I just uh, used a um, stock one from, I, th I forgot exactly. Oh, yeah, it was Contributors Convent. Um, so there's that, and the blog is also in the wiki. Uh, for documentation, this one's really interesting. So I wanted the code to be basically self-documenting. So I have an example over here. Um, so it's fairly robust, I'd say. So you would have like, uh, for each of your functions, you'd basically describe what the function is, uh, what its purpose is, what its usage is. And a little note um, being like what um anything that uh the developer would know so for example this is um a code block that i kind of like uh pulled out for this uh this is a better example of the documentation so you can see here it has uh what you input into it what it outputs uh what the purpose is and like an example of running and the reason why it had to be created so interestingly node.js doesn't have a or js in general doesn't really have a seeded random function so I kind of had to write my own one, which is why this is there. So that's kind of like um, how most of the documentation is done. It's mostly done through comments. Um, so there's that. So for progress, I think I hit, or I'm close to hitting most of uh, what I set out to do. So reorganizing the code base, that's uh, more or less done. So instead of just having one file for just one site, everything's uh, now segmented basically, so that way it's a little bit easier to navigate. Uh, any files that are shared between multiple different ones, I've isolated into like a shared folder, 
I've kept all the files for specific sites in their own sort of area. Um, more sites to download from. So I've added about five uh, more sites. They're in various states of finished. Um, so I've added XKCD, I've added Imager, I've added a site called Pixiv. Uh, it's another sort of fo uh, photo sort of downloading site. Uh, and some more. I'm also working on adding archive.org as well. Um, so that's, uh, so I think I've hit um, this one fairly well, I think. Different download options. This one's been sidelined for now because there is a few, I'd like to first increase this one before adding uh, different options as well. And also a command line interface. This one's in progress. Uh, and this one's also another reason why this one's been kind of sidelined. Uh, different download options really only matter if I have like a command line interface to give those options, right? So this one's currently in progress. Uh, I have to make a pull request for this. The code should be uh, finished, but I have to do some more testing, do a pull request, et cetera. And some future goals. So one, I'd like to eventually do this. This one seems like it'd be a good option. Um, so adding different download options. Uh, here are some examples, basically. Um, another one is that for this project, I used uh, Puppeteer, uh, which is just like a web testing and automation sort of thing. Um, and I want to move over to Puppeteer Core, which is like a more stripped down version of Puppeteer and has a few benefits. So one, Puppeteer Core is more lightweight. And part of the reason why it's uh, lightweight is because um, Puppeteer installs Chromium. Uh, it basically is, you can kind of think of it as like headless Chrome. Uh, so because of that, um, you know, it tends to be a little bit more bulkier. And Puppeteer Core doesn't necessarily have to use Chromium. It can use other um, uh, web browsers that you have installed, like, for example, Firefox. So I'd like to possibly transfer over to this. This is more of a long-term uh, issue, though. And the final one is to try to get it into, like, an Arch or Ubuntu official repository. Uh, PPAs and also Arch user repos are also an option. And the reason why is because I went looking uh, specifically in the Ubuntu repository, and there isn't really anything like specifically like uh, my project. There is YouTube DL, and there is like a few other sorts of downloaders for different sorts of media, but not specifically for like graphic novels or like um, web comics or the such. So I think that would be kind of cool to, you know, be able to have this as a goal. Uh, obviously, this one's more in the long term when I actually get some of the other stuff working. And here's some examples for some contributions. Uh, I also worked on a few other projects as well besides just this. Um, so if any of you know who what Bonobot is, uh, then yeah, I also worked a little bit on that as well. So I think that's it. Um, any questions? So I'm, I am not, ah, there we go. Yeah. So legal, re, uh, legal issues. That's definitely, um, something that I was a little bit worried about. Fortunately though, there is, um, well, that's also one reason why, um, the MIT license also kind of like, uh, saves me here. It basically, uh, if I remember correctly, um, it has a clause that says, um, you know, the developer isn't uh, responsible for how the project is used. They just provide it as is. So any copyright issues would be on the user, the user and not developer. So there's that. Also for testing purposes, there are actually, um, uh, this surprised me, there are a few actual um, Creative Commons and public domain sorts of um, web comics and also graphic novels as well. Uh, one of them is XKCD. There's this French artist that I know who has his own webcomic, and he also has um, a few like uh, graphic novels. Uh, he actually hosts uh, the SVG files for them on GitLab. I'll see if I can try to find them. I might post them in the in the chat, but yeah. Is there a feature for downloading large batches of files? Uh, that's not there yet. It only downloads um, the things on the link that you have at the moment. So for example, if you provided a link that only had one chapter, it would only download that one chapter, right? 
Um, that would uh, that actually be another feature that I'd probably want to add. Um, downloading multiple batches of uh, files. Anyone else? I, I like the discussion on the legal issues. Um, so yeah, it's, it's I mean, good you, it's good you thought about it. You know. Yeah, I remember uh, a while back, uh, YouTube DL also got a DMCA notice. Um, I think it was for including like an example of how it worked, and they included like um, an actual link to a video um, that they didn't own the rights to, and that's why they got uh, it with a DMCA notice. Um, so yeah, that was a little bit scary to think of, but I think I've mostly skirted around that issue. So yeah. Yeah, you know. Yeah, one of their tests was involved with that. Um, Project identifier. Uh, oh, go ahead. You can you can answer it if you want. Oh yeah. Um. Actually, I don't. Oh yeah. Um, zero like zero. The name? Yeah zero zero. There you go. Thank you, Nick. Nick's got it. Oh Me, yeah. Miso is the product project name. Um, oh yeah. I'll. Uh, uh, paste this over here so in case if anybody uh, being, still needs to write it down they're being nice to me by by putting in the the identifiers that means that I don't have to uh, exercise my memory which is good um, mm -hmm. all right uh, very very nicely done uh, I think you uh, you set a high bar as the first one and I do appreciate you going first um, not that I gave you a choice but uh but uh <laughs> that's that's uh, always appreciated um Let's our next our next uh, presentation is O one O O three O's one seven Hotop B. I'll paste that in, I guess. So feel free to uh, ask yourself or to invite yourself forward. Um, everybody else, get your get your next uh, your next best uh, versions up. Brian, are you here? hear me i can hear you i can't see i can see you but i can't oh there's actually a face right, on i'm gonna share my screen some of you people actually have faces you're not just uh you're not just blips. i know it's crazy it is crazy okay i'm gonna pull up the presentation Okay, uh, let me know when you can see my screen. What's up? <clears throat> okay, so the project I worked on this semester with the one other group member, Sean, is Fast Food Database. Uh, the point of our project is to basically provide menu item data for restaurants. Uh, and this is like slightly better than um, Google Maps because they don't provide menu item data. And it's better than the people who do have the menu item data, like Grubhub, Uber Eats, because they don't provide a public API. And the <clears throat> two major uh, tenets of our project that we wanted to include were the user contributed aspect, and then the fact that it's managed by the users as well. So in our project repo, which is on GitHub, we have contribution guidelines, uh, our README, which basically describes, like the previous slide, the purpose of the project. Uh, we have our code of conduct, which is adapted from the contributor covenant. It's actually the same code of conduct that the Rust team uses. Uh, all the documentation for, documentation for our project is in line, so it's written in comments uh, with the code, both for the front end, the view app, and the back end. Um, our issue tracker is just GitHub's issue tracker, but it doesn't get a lot of use because it's just me and Sean working on the project right now. Uh, our license is the MIT license. Uh, pretty much, whoops, just like Prasant said, it's one of the most permissive licenses. So we wanted to allow anybody to use our software however they wanted. Uh, and yeah, our repository is 
structured with the benevolent dictator for life uh, idea. So Sean and I have the final say for pull requests. Okay, so the contributions that we've made this semester include a skeleton app, um, which basically is a view front end that has um, a list of menu items, a list for restaurants, and then uh, login and logout functionality for the front end, and then a profile page so the user can hopefully, when we implement this, see what their contributions are, and then a simple add item form. Uh, I also dockerized the app with Docker Compose after the Docker Lab because uh, Sean's actually on Windows and I'm on Linux. So I wanted him to be able to develop really easily and for us not to have any issues uh, with compatibility. Um, recently, we also were able to hit our backend with Axios, which uh, we have pictures of later in the slides. Um, and we had to change our backend from Rocket RS, which is Rust web server, to Django because um, Rocket doesn't have first class support for user authentication with uh, Auth0, which is what we're using. Um, and then, yeah, because we we're because we switched to Django, we also were able to add authentication to our front end. Uh, protect the API endpoints that unauthenticated users shouldn't be able to access on the back end, and then actually hit the protected endpoints and authenticate with our API. Okay, so I actually have a demo of the login here. I'm going to play this. Okay, so basically what I just showed is that we're getting a JSON web token from a third-party auth server. And that's what we use to <clears throat> authenticate with our backend to make sure that you basically can't add menu items if you're not authenticated. And then here's an example of us hitting the API. Um, with hitting a protected endpoint on the API. So if you look here, uh, you can see the token that we send as a as a header on the HTTP request. Uh, these, these are some recent changes that we made to the look of the website. Um, this is also uh, an example of the view elements that we have to show the menu items. OK, so a few of the issues that we encountered working on the project. Uh, first, the issue I mentioned earlier, where Sean is on Windows and I'm on Linux. So uh, he had some issues setting up WSL, or sorry, uh, Postgres on WSL. So we actually fixed that by just docketing the app, uh, made it pretty convenient, and also made it easier for uh, people, makes it easier for people to get started, because they can just clone the repo, and then if they have Docker installed, run Docker Compose, build Docker Compose up. Um, and then also this thing I mentioned where I had to switch to Django because Rocket doesn't have first class authentication support. And then one major issue with our project right now is that basically I've hard coded every single URL. Uh, so I think the correct way to do things would be to inject it or inject the uh, like URLs to the front end and back end as environment variables in the Docker Compose file and then access them in the code. Um, but right now they're just committed to our repo, so we, we're really not ready to deploy. Yeah, and that's pretty much the status of our project right now. Thanks.
All right. Uh, thanks, Brian. Anybody, uh, anybody have any? I see one comment for Yay Docker, uh, which I think is a, a good comment. Um, do we have any any other comments about comments or questions about about uh, Brian's presentation? So I think you know, from from my standpoint, the, the 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 significant thing that you did there was you know. One of the things I liked was that transition to Docker because if you're going to develop on multi-platform, that is, uh, you know, that's a very important, and, and from supporting a multi multiple community, you know, even if it's only uh, the two of you, that, you know, that's a really important step. You you need to make it easy for people to contribute uh, from from multiple platforms. So that was kind of cool. Um, the question I have is, you're, you're trying to build up a user contribution. Right, you're trying to to build up crowdsourcing. Yep. Have you have you talked to anybody about the psychology of of you know gamification or or ways to get people to uh, crowdsource? You know, because that's not necessarily a given that yeah. if you have something cool, it works, right? Yeah. So, I think you basically hit on the biggest problem, which is that nobody wants to sit at their computer and like copy down McDonald's menu into the website, right? So I think. Once I have the basic front end showing the information from the database, uh, authenticating users and allowing them to add menu items if they have permission, then I can basically let people hit the API uh, that when they're logged in and they could maybe automate some of that themselves or we could build some functionality to automate the uh, menu entry or the entry of the menu information. Cool. Yeah, I wonder if this is a good point. Uh, I think it's not quite like it is with Uber Eats, right? Because with Uber Eats, the businesses will put the menu items on there themselves because it has like a benefit for them. But there's not really an incentive for that here unless somebody else starts using our API to build like a food delivery service or something. Yep. Cool. Um, all right. Um, let's see. We our next. Why don't we start transitioning away from away from you? Get you off the hot seat. Um, and it's O one five K H A G H K. I'm not sure how I would, would pronounce that. Um, I can pronounce the whole name, I think, but not but not necessarily the uh, the abbreviated RPI. Uh, RCSID kind of thing. Um, do we, I have somebody with a hand raised? Oops. I'm going to make Brian go again, apparently. Um, you're invited to the stage. So there was an article, while we're waiting for, for this one to come up, there was an article uh, on Medium or something a few days ago um, where they were talking about somebody reverse engineering the McDonald's shake machine because apparently McDonald's shake machines go down relatively often. Um, and they are um, the absolute opposite of open source. So um, they're, they're undocumented esoteric commands to, to actually set all of the properties of the shake machine um, and, and get it back running again. So somebody reverse engineered that and came up with a little box that'll sit in the machine and and give you a user friendly interface for it. Have you see, did you see that at all, Brian? So what happens? So according to this article, what happens is that there's a four hour pasteurization phase that's supposed to happen every night, Josh. Um, and, and again, I this is just off the article, and I have not read anything that I knew anything about in the mainstream media that was presented correctly, and in any any media, you know, it's just not. Um, they're just not experts at what we're experts at but the pasteurization cycle is a four-hour cycle that's supposed to take place at night and that's the the uh, because of cleaning if it's interrupted for anything like you unplug it or power goes out or something like that it gets it gets in a stuck cycle and uh, you have to restart the entire four-hour cycle so that would be part of the reason why they're down always before because of clean cleaning um, according to to uh, to this particular article. 
Is anyone else having problems with screens coming in and out? Yes, there you go, Lifehacker. That's it. It's an interesting article, and it kind of goes to what what uh, what Brian and company are trying to uh, to uh, fix. Sorry, Kevin. Um, I didn't actually mean to take up your time, but why don't we? Uh... That's okay. Yeah. Are we ready? Can everybody hear me? I can hear you. Um, That's good gonna... enough for me. Yeah, that that should mean everybody, because I seem to be the one with the problem sometimes. All right. In that case, hello. I am going to be discussing Submitty, which is a project I think we all know and love, or at least know and are familiar with. Let's begin. In terms of members, I am the only OSS Submitty member. There are a couple people presenting Arcos, actually, Arcos Submitty later tonight, and I will be included there. But uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I have never heard of them. I'm not going to give a huge description of Submitty because I think, again, we've all used it at this point, but I will give you at least the definition that they use for themselves. And that is an open source course management, assignment submission, exam, and grading system. And I think that's pretty accurate. Uh, their primary purpose is to offer and auto grade assignments. We've all used gradables before. And in case you've never seen the instructor side of things, each gradable can actually be uh, differentiated as a homework, a quiz, or an exam and that funnels into rainbow grades. So MIDI has recently expanded some of its features as well to match up with remote learning. We've added a polling feature, which some classes like uh, Constantine's database systems has started using. And we've also seen enhancements to the discussion forum over last fall and this spring. So that's the MIDI's description. What is its role and how is it expanding? Again, because of remote learning, we are seeing expansions to some of the old features. And uh, every student and faculty is welcome to start suggesting features as well. We listen more heavily to the faculty. But we do have an issue tracker that we'll see in just a moment. I've already talked about seeing new submissions as well as exams, because again, we're all remote here. And then some of the goals for Submitty this semester are to expand on the peer grading system, which I've been working on for Arcos actually, but that's neither here nor there. More auto grading support for additional languages. I think some of the database languages now have auto grading support. And to never, ever crash the production server. If Submitty goes down, I, as a computer science student, would be furious. And I would never hear the end of it either, because I'm a developer too. At the same time, I had my own set of goals for this semester as a first, uh, first semester student developer for Submitty. I want to first familiarize myself with how Submitty works under the hood. I want to start working on good first issues, and I want to be able to review pull requests for the more advanced issues so I get a sense of what I can do in future semesters. Let's take a look at Submitty itself, though. It is organized as perhaps the open source project. We have a lot of the standard things that you would expect for any open source project. We have a README, which you have a snippet there. We use the BSD3 clause license. We have an issue tracker that is extremely active. People say that Submitty has no issues. We are, of course, lying through our teeth. We have several. Don't look at the numbers. Don't do it. You'll see them later. And perhaps the weak link in this is the discussion forum for Submitty itself. We don't really have one. We use the issue tracker. And also, we'll talk about a Slack in just a second. In terms of contributions, uh, we use a blessed repository model with continuous integration. So we have tests that are run every time you submit a pull request to merge your code into Submitty. I have to deal with a lot of those. There are even some down to the name of the pull request. You have to be very specific for that. I don't have any images of that, though, so you'll just have to believe me. We also have a contribution guide, which I could open in a moment, but I don't want to waste your time. You can find this whole slide, of course, on the OSS Discord right now, as well as a style guide on how to program and comment. We do have documentation. This I don't have linked. I'm sorry, but I'm confident you'll be able to find it if you look on submitty.org, which is our website which you can see there. And if you want to get in touch with any of us, we do have a public Slack page that you could join right now and ask for features or ask for me to change your grade to an A. I cannot do this, but you could always ask for it. And then, of course, we have a blog, which I have posted to. All right. Because Submitty is an established project and we have been working on it, we, as in Submitty developers, have been working on it since 2014, I don't need to really add more legs to this table. It's got four legs to stand on. But I have worked on some things. First of all, I've learned the ropes, so to speak, and I've familiarized myself with how Vagrant works. 
because we have a virtual machine where you can push your own changes to a local server and then look at that in real time, which is pretty much essential to any sort of uh, work on submitting front end or back end. In terms of the more advanced features, I've begun looking at uh, pull requests, and I've reviewed several at this point. This was one of the more advanced pull requests here. You can only see five lines of it, of course, but this spans several uh, pages, just to give you a sense of what Submitty looks like. I don't have it mentioned here, but in the interim review, I mentioned that Submitty is made up of a lot of languages, Twig, PHP, JavaScript, et cetera, and all of these come into play. And then the main contribution I've done so far for OSS is this bug fix for issue 5897. This is the same thing that I showed off in the interim report, where we have this strange message. Uh, we have a version mismatch sort of dialogue here. And you shouldn't actually see this message unless you've selected a different version. But when I reproduced this, you could reproduce this with only one active version. So how could there be a version mismatch? The truth is, uh, this issue is actually caused by submitting a gradable. The TA begins to grade part of this uh, manual grade, and then grades are released before the TA can finish, and you would get this result. So I've created a new clause inside of Submitty, and now you will see this custom message, or at least you will as soon as the merge takes place. These things take time. All right, in that case, let's look at what Submitty still needs this semester or for future semesters. We've accomplished a lot of bug fixes because, again, Submitty does have issues. Don't tell Barb. We have some new features and some expansions to them. I've seen a lot of uh, posts for the Submitty polls and for peer grading. And I don't think Submitty's gone down this semester. It's just slow. You know how it is. There are still issues to date, though. Uh, one of them is more on the instructor side concerning a non-mode for your TA graders. Sometimes you want to be able to see the, the names of students that you're grading. Other times, maybe it creates a conflict of interest, so you can hide them and actually scramble their names. That's a non-mode. We also have a specific uh, drop-down menu, breaking for certain browsers like Firefox. And there are many more, which you can find at the issue tracker. Yeah, and now looking into the next semester. What do we still need? What could you do, perhaps, for Submitty uh, next semester over the summer or the fall? Well, the peer grading still needs some polish, I believe. Uh, more classes are starting to use peer grading, and in fact, I believe Arcos right now is using a bit of a peer grading system to determine uh, part of the presentation grade, which is great, because the more eyes on a feature, the more things we can change, the more features are suggested. That's just open source. Uh, other changes that we want to see include the notebook editor, which very few classes are using right now. But this is a sort of way of uh, looking at all of the files that you've submitted for a given gradable, and you should be actually be able to view them. Like you can open up a PDF in the browser and images and text files and hopefully even code files, but that's coming, not yet. And finally, we're going to want to see more auto grading information actually. Have you ever submitted a, pro a program to let's say operating systems and it runs and it runs and it runs and you're not sure if it's doing anything? Hopefully we'll have things, just basic statistics like runtime displayed. So now you can see Oh, wow, it ran for almost 40 seconds. That's definitely on me then. It's not the program taking too long. It's my, no, I've said that wrong. Uh, it's not that the auto grader is doing something. It's that my program is hanging somewhere. So those are the details we'd like to see coming to Submitty. And that's it. Any questions? It's your time to, a to ask questions about Submitty if you have them. Yes. Uh, yes, this is the part where you ask me to change your grade to an A. I think we've already made that joke, but it's 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 the only joke we have, really. That and Submitty has no issues. So yeah, Eli, that's that's the correct project. Um, so I'm going to make one comment, uh, and then maybe I'll ask a question. Um, but uh, so you mentioned that that Arcos is using um, the peer grading to to do to grade presentations. Um, so it may. It may uh, intrigue you guys why we're not doing that here. Um, I figure I'm giving uh, Professor uh, Cutler enough uh, grief on that one right now. Um, for some reason, when we try to peer grade, not everybody can get into peer grade. And, and there are, are three times the number of students or four times the number of students uh, in, in our course than in this class. Um, but as a fallback, I had to do a form anyway. Um, so rather than forcing you guys to... Uh, to use the form, or you know, to, to try to use Submitty and then fall back to the form, uh, I made the determination that we would we would uh, 
I've given her enough test data. She doesn't need to be bothered with, with this course as well. Uh, and, uh, and you guys don't need to be bothered by something that is still a little bit problematic. So I agree. Yeah. Kevin has a, has a good question about, well, uh, Ayush has a question about how did you make progress if Smitty has no issues, which I think you, you've kind of answered. You've got me there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then are there other groups that use Submitty other than RPI? Um, so do you want to handle that? I one? believe many other universities have actually, if not universities, then individuals from universities have reached out about Submitty. I believe currently our stance is that Submitty is an RPI project. We're not basically giving solutions to other people. They can take Submitty and begin to use it for themselves, but I don't think we're offering solutions for other universities. So I can expand on that a little bit. Um, Submitty has at least in, in, in previous semesters, just because I've, I've been associated with Submitty as a user for, for longer, um, they, they've actually been installed at multiple universities. And again, you're right. We're not supporting it. It's not like it's us making money or, or running it for them. Um, but Professor Cutler does have a, does answer questions from them. Um, Walla Walla has used it. Um, Sapenzia de Roma, University of Sapenzia de Roma has used it before. King's College has used it. I'm not sure which King's College because there's like a lot of them. Um, but yeah, so so it it has it has been used before. But but as you say, it's not really your focus. Cool time zones, huh? Okay. Yeah. That's uh yeah that's uh Sapienza de Roma. That was fun. All right. Um. Nicely done. Uh, next up is we're whipping through these. You guys are keeping the schedule good, so I'm I'm uh, I'm gratified by people generally doing a good job and getting out about at the buzzer or so, um, which is uh, that means we're giving you the right amount of time. I'm trying to find the window so I can type in. The next presentation is 00011 Kian M. I do like that you guys have so much uh, dependence, you know, on on your issue tracker and everything. It's used pretty heavily, um, and I I do think that everybody should go in at least once and take a look at the. Submitty issue tracker and, and how Submitty is organized. It really is a very well run open source project. So okay. we have all, we have all uh, five people people on our team presenting today. So we may have to temporarily kick the mentors out so everyone can fit on stage. You guys have all separate pre presentations? No, we're all, we're presenting together, but we're all like presenting different slides of it. Okay. Are all your people in yet? Or I've got Trevor. Uh, hello. Uh, can Steve people hear me? Steven. Yep. Okay, are you guys all set? I think or... we're all set, so I'll start sharing my screen. Okay. All right, we're all good? Okay. Um, so our project was uh, the Deep Blue uh, Minecraft Dimension Mod, and our group members are Trevor, Andrew, Mac, uh, Stephen, and myself. And uh, basically, uh, the initial project description was that we were going to add a water dimension to Minecraft. So, like, similar to the end and like the Nether, if you've played the game before, um, and also like those. Um, we were going to add a portal to the, the dimension with uh, world generation. So basically, it would be separate from the main map. 
and um, within that generated world, there would be new biomes that would be, you know, explorable. And some other potential features that we thought about were um, basically a new ore and like some tool sets to work with. Uh, for example, like a, a scuba tank because it's all underwater. Um, then we also wanted to add a final boss and some extra visual effects. So for, uh, I'm Trevor, I'll give some overview on the technical details and the common issues that we ran into. So we were making this mod on the Java edition of Minecraft. So as the name suggests, it's all in Java. And Minecraft does not have any real official modern API, so we are using the Minecraft Forge API. Forge has an LGPL license, which allows us to use an MIT license for our project. And we wanted to use an MIT license mainly because we didn't really think of any reason we wanted it to be any more restrictive than that. We want anyone to contribute or to use this for whatever they want. And uh, Minecraft Forge also is bundled with Gradle for building, and this allowed us to easily set up continuous integration because we could create a GitHub action that for any pull requests to the main branch, it checks that everything is able to build properly. So in terms of uh, how the overall experience is of trying to mod Minecraft, we figured we would might as well just start on the most recent version of Minecraft, and we looked through the official Forge documentation. What we found there was that it's not very beginner-friendly. Uh, it's not super in-depth. It mostly just gives you function names, what parameters they take in, and what they return. It doesn't provide many examples of how to actually use them and incorporate everything together. And when trying to look up uh, just on forums or Stack Overflow or whatever, uh, answers to the questions that came up, we found that they would be for outdated versions and the solutions no longer apply. Also, many times the answers people would give would use different mappings because all of the code is has to be decompiled and deobfuscated, and there are a few different ways to do that when you're using Minecraft Forge. And ultimately, what we ended up doing was just looking at other mods, looking at what was already in the Minecraft code, and just reading through a lot of that to understand how things work. And if that failed, we would look for uh, Discord servers or other close communities of Minecraft modders and directly ask people who do know what's going on. All right, so now we're going to take a look at our contribution guidelines. Since Minecraft modders are pretty open to contributing to each other's projects, uh, we made sure to include a contribution guidelines document. Outside developers, like outside of our team, can contribute by making pull requests with features they want to add uh, or maybe bug fixes. Our contribution guidelines document, it guides them through the process of setting up the development environment, uh, and it also details the steps they should follow leading up to their pull request. Uh, for example, the developers that want to add new features uh, should first make an issue post with an enhancement label uh, so we can chat with them about how well their feature will fit into our mod. Uh, and also, all contributors have to follow our style guidelines as well as our code of conduct. And I'll go into these two documents on the next slide. So our style guidelines can be found in our contributions file of the project, uh, which ensures that contributors can't miss them. Uh, so since the format of our Java files in the mod can vary widely depending on their purpose, we don't really have any formal guidelines for the Java code itself. Uh, however, we do have strict guidelines on where files should be placed, as well as the frequency of comments. Uh, almost all the files that are added to the mod, like right now and probably in the future, will fall into one of the directories we see on the right here. Uh, this is pretty much the bulk of our code. Um, and our code of conduct is a modified version of the contributor covenant, uh, which we've seen already in our previous two presentations. Uh, and it's a popular code of conduct for open source projects. Ideally, we shouldn't have to enforce this code of conduct, but if necessary, we will do so according to the document's enforcement guidelines. Uh, it'll most likely come into play on the issue tracker page, uh, as this is going to most likely see the most traffic from users. 
Okay, so I'll start talking about some of the progress we've made on a project. So um, we've added a couple new blocks, um, specifically uh, soak stone and soak sand. Um, the difference between these blocks and the regular Minecraft blocks is that um, when you break them, they get replaced with a, a water source. So um, it's to encourage uh, people uh, exploring our dimension to um, use the uh, tools that we'll give them for water breathing and such. And uh, we've also added, uh, well, so far only one new item, but um, it's the uh, scuba tank. Uh, you can equip it and it gives you water breathing, uh, but only when you're underwater. And then once you go through the surface at uh, sort of uh, the durability, it kind of acts like your breath meter. And then we've temporarily added a uh, basic recipe just to uh, uh, test stuff, but um, we'll probably change that uh, when we add more items and materials. Uh, so we've started adding some new mobs um, to kind of, you know, liven up the biome that we're creating. Um, so we've got a blobfish and a sea urchin. Uh, as, as you can tell, they're very lifelike. Um, yeah, that's what they look like in game and they behave kind of how you'd expect. So they will, uh, the blobfish will swim around in water. Uh, the sea urchin just sits on the ocean floor. Um, and if they're taken out of water, um, they will start to suffocate. Um, so this is kind of a cross section of what we want the biome to actually look like. Um, so there's air pockets at the top, which is where you'd spawn. Um, and then it's a big open ocean in the middle, which would be full of large monsters like sharks and things like that. Um, and then at the bottom, there'd be some caves. Um, we, we, want, we want some plants growing on the bottom. And then um, the biome is mostly stone with some sand patches throughout. Um, so you can go to the next slide. And um, this is kind of the current state of that generation. It's hard to get a good screenshot of what it looks like because the biome is so tall. Um, but on the left, this is the air pockets at the top of the biome. Um, and then at the, on the right, that's kind of the ocean floor. And you can kind of see that rough terrain. And we have some caves spawning in as well as the sand mixed throughout. Um, so for the future goals, we're basically staying in line with that initial project plan. Um, the big thing is, you know, finishing up the biome, making it look better with um, more variety in blocks, adding the plants to the bottom. Um, also, the visual effects you mentioned at the, at the beginning, where we want it to be so that um, the deeper you go into the biome, the darker it becomes. Um, and also, the, the big thing that we're missing is it's not actually a new dimension yet. It's supposed to be um, you make a portal and you get teleported to this water um, dimension. Um, currently, we just have it spawning in the overworld for testing because we don't have that dimension. Um, we want to add lots more mobs, especially hostile mobs and maybe some bosses like a Leviathan or a Kraken. Um, and then at the caves in the bottom, we want to add a new um, type of ore, which you could mine to create some um, cool new tool sets. Uh, that's all. So thank you. Are there any questions? Our contributions are in the, the next slides. Just for Wes. I, I see there's a question asking if the sea urchins and blobfish drop anything when killed. Currently, no, but we were we have been uh, considering the, uh, having them drop items that you can combine with tools to add special properties. We're still figuring out how exactly we would want that to work. So one of the things, let's see, are there any more questions in chat before I waiting for the, ch the chat to come up? Come on. Um, yeah, so one of the things that, that I'm kind of interested in is uh, you, you right off the bat, you mentioned some problems with getting documentation. Um, did you guys think about um, part of your, your uh, contributions being able to you know, put together a definitive document that kind of talks about the issues you're running into, or are you documenting those issues as you go along so that you can, uh, um, you know, so the next time through it's easier for the next group or, or, or uh, did you get any thought to that? Cause that sounds like that might be a good open source project in and of itself. Yeah. I've, I've done a little bit of that just through the, uh, blog posts, like my most recent one, I basically just, uh, talked about ex some experimenting I did with a certain uh, block property and how that like impacts whether or not a certain function is called when the block is broken. But mm -hmm. we haven't done anything like 
comprehensive, really. Is that, you know, I, I'm just... I can speak... Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was just saying, um, like, with my own experience, so I, I'm um, working on creating the biome itself, um, and that in particular, there was, like, no documentation on. So um, I've thought about, like, I could, you know, kind of create just the base example mod that adds one biome, and step-by-step, step, this is how you'd add it. Um, but I think kind of the problem with that and why it's not really done is that um, Forge is constantly updating to the new version of Minecraft, and then everyone forgets the old one. And so by the time you could have, like, anyone would have made that documentation, it's kind of worthless. It's, like, kind of, it, it's it's updating too quickly. So the, the real thing you have to do, which once I figured this out, it made it a lot easier, is there's lots of Discord servers where you can just ask people for help on modding. And then they'll walk you through step by step how to do things, and that's how I was able to learn everything. Cool. Um, there might be like some way to like generalize it, but again, because the builds change so quickly, all the technical details are like constantly shifting as well. Okay. I'm still seeing that that's a that's an opportunity. Not a problem. So just just throwing it out there. <laughs> All right. Um, our next. Uh, any more questions as as we're kind of setting up for uh, Orlang two. O O one four Orlang two. What bird is that, by the way? In your. Uh, in your uh, magic window. Oh, sorry. Um, I don't rightly know. It's just a pretty picture. It is a pretty picture. It's a pretty bird. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Surprisingly oh, okay. enough, I can. Uh, that's good news. That's very good news. Um, so, yeah, uh, I guess we'll just get started. Um, oh, that's the wrong button. So, uh, my name is Gabe Orlansky, and I've worked on Allen NLP this semester. Um, basically, the very brief overview is that Allen NLP is a natural language processing library specifically designed for quick development of research models. The focus is definitely more on um, the research side than the, than the deployment side. So basically, there's a main repo, a GitHub Allen NLP, and then there's a development repo that I'm using. So the very brief overview, and as I mentioned, it's more research focused than uh you know actually deploying it in the real world so that's why you have these json or, or json net configs as the one seen on the right so basically what all you need to do is you just need to put in the name of the um classes that you want to run for your reader for your loader for the model and the, the trainer amongst other things and basically what this allows you to do is just quickly develop and prototype modules that have very little uh dependencies on on other modules so you don't need to be messing around with different ways of loading, of having a user input different model names. It makes life much easier in terms of the research side. So the project structure is that there's one main repository, and that's the Allen NLP main repository. Then from Allen AI, they have a bunch of smaller repositories, whether that be for models, um, tutorials, if you want to use uh, this library inside of a Python script rather than through a JSON config. And they also have ones for different integrations with hyperparameter tuning, et cetera. They also have a main website, allennlp.org, with documentation, demos, et cetera. It's very well organized, and it's a very easy to use website. Our development, or I should say my development, of what I've been working on for this project has been done in its own repository, mainly just for easily navigating through the code, because otherwise I would have to be working with 85,000 lines all by myself. So I just made my life easier to just do it in a separate repository than to put it into the correct repository and make the pull request. So they also have a very detailed contribution guidelines and they have constant calls for contributors on their social media. So their style guidelines, basically they want you to use the Python library black and follow that, but they also want you to follow Google's style guide, which includes the Google doc strings instead of the normal doc strings. And inside of their repository in of itself, they have PyTest testing and GitHub actions for new changes. And most of the communication is mainly done inside the issues, as there is internal communication within Allen AI, 
because this is made for them and by them. But issues are where, you know, people like myself or other contributors can connect with the main engineers from Allen AI. But the, the GitHub discussions, they've been slowly migrating more towards that. And there's a lot more activity than there was when I first started working on this project. So for this semester, after, after talking with the people from Allen AI, they, they suggested that working on implementing the record data set reader would be a very good starting task and it would be a good uh, task for a student specifically. So basically it would just be the one implement the reader so that can read the data and then create a Google Collab notebook for using this reader with a question answering model. And I thought that, oh, this would not be that difficult of a task. And so I had also made the stretch goals of trying to Im implement the two other tasks from the super glue benchmark, the choice of plausible alternatives and multi-sentence reading comprehension. But as you'll see later, it was a much more involved task to implement a single reader than I was expecting. So just going over the, the data set itself that I had to implement, it's a reading comprehension with common sense reasoning data set. There's a bunch of different types of reasoning tasks as they're part of this data set, as shown by the picture on the right. And basically it's a bunch of CNN Daily Mail articles and your goal and the goal of the model is to be able to understand what's happening in a given span and predict the entity that they're that's been marked by that red X. So basically you're given a article and you want to predict, oh, are they talking about Tracy Morgan or Tina Fey if they're talking about an SNL thing? Or in, in the case of one of the examples, if they're talking about Donald Trump or the FEC in re response to the um, campaign issues. So this is part of a much larger benchmark that I mentioned earlier called Super Glue. It's made by NYU, University of Washington, DeepMind and Facebook. That's supposed to be a, one of the top benchmarks for general language understanding in these models. So my goal was to implement this data set reader. Now, the issues started to arise when one, I had to learn Allen LP, but thankfully they have very good documentation, very good guides. But also the issue is that they wanted this reader to be compatible with a very specific type of model that they already had implemented. And the inputs didn't line up perfectly. So such as things like entities, there was no way to put to pass through entities to the different model and that caused a bit of issues. And there was a decent amount of times that I spent talking with them about how to overcome this issue. And thankfully we did, we were able to completely implement the record reader. I was able to do minimal tests, very basic examples. Now, unfortunately, I also don't really have a demo on it. It's not gonna be as cool as, you know, Minecraft, a video of the mod. It would just be showing different strings getting tokenized, but there is a, in the repository, there is a demo config that you can use to run a very quick modest toy example. I still need to work a bit more on the full length Google collab um, example. And I also need to work more on the documentation and the additional tests as well. And I'm hoping that by the end of next week, I can have the full pull request ready to be made. And so I can start going through the code review process of getting this actually put into the full Allen NLP library. And yeah, that commits, and that's about it. So unfortunately I was on mute. Uh, any any questions for uh for Alan and LP? So um sometimes my questions are more like comments. Uh I, I kinda like that that um that it was hard to get a to get a uh a simple reader in because you know what that's actually telling us is that this project Right, it's not just writing some code, hacking out some stuff, and throwing it up there. Right, They're, they, the, the fact that you've been this successful means that they've sat down with you and and helped you work through the issues with, with uh, you know the data types or the uh, or the the, the the semantics of matching the semantics of of the of the, the 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 problem that you were trying to implement with their solution process, uh, and it also means that. Uh, they're requiring you to do all the stuff, produce all the artifacts that are actually going to make this useful. Um, so rather than hacking out something that that you know might do what you want it to do, but isn't maintainable and isn't usable by a by a broad group, you know this is is you know the extra effort you put in is actually going to increase 
uh, the number of people who are going to be able to use it. So one of the things I wanted to talk to, so now having having done that that long, you know, pre prequel, um, how was the how was it how hard was it to get them interested in working with you, and, and what, what what was that process like? Oh, I just I emailed them at the very beginning of the semester where once he said we could do external projects, I emailed them because I was already interested in learning how to use it. Um, and I got a response like the very next day saying, oh, this is a task that we think would be a good idea. Please let us know if you have any like questions or any, if any issues comes up. And just from there, I've been able to communicate with a, I think it's the head of the engineering team currently there. And he's been very helpful with just helping me answer the questions I've had. So how big is Allen NLP? Uh, not, the, not the code base, um, the, uh, the, the, the company. So the team that's working on Allen NLP, I think there's like 10 engineers, research engineers, but in Allen AI, the Allen Institute for um, Artificial Intelligence, they have they have about, I think, four major big projects. And then on each, I think there's like 10 or 20 um, researchers. So I think it's like 80 people total. Okay. And they usually take in um, like 20 something interns over the summer or winter and fall. Cool. Um, yeah. So if you look it's a at very this, big uh, group. By 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 being nice enough to talk to you, they increased their workforce by ten percent on this on this specific project. Right? So Yeah, yeah. You know, so when you think about that, when, when you know when you're you know, when you're creating a project and running a project, right, being nice to people and answering their questions, you know, can can can, can pay off, you know, right? I mean it can pay off for you too. So, you know, so, so I think that's good job. I, I like, I like this external, this external, uh, outreach. Um, and I think you picked a good, I think you picked a project that, you know, either accidentally or, or by due diligence, you picked a project that is, is really suited for this kind of, of, uh, external collaboration. Not all open source projects are that nicely, uh, are that nicely arranged. So good job. Any other questions for him? This is kind of a, You'll notice that that we didn't talk a whole lot about natural language processing, right? Um, which is, you know, unfortunate. But that's not what that's not what the salient part of the project was, right? I mean, you you were doing something that is critical for for allowing them to advance that part of it. So, yeah, yeah, I I, I like this. A good good presentation. Um, but I hope you are getting a chance to. To, if, if you're interested in, L, in NLP, to, to figure out how to use this as you go along as well. I, I definitely think, well, at least the more comfortable I've gotten with it, it's been easier to actually use mm -hmm. in terms of the more research side of it. Cool. Good job. Um, we have, I think, one more, and we have 20 minutes. So we should be absolutely in good shape right now, I think. Um, 00013 O'Connor. Four. Do we have o o o o o o o one three O'Connor four? However many O's we want to go. Hey, you should be able to see my screen now. Is that the case? I can, in fact, see you. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Um, I think we're using the same exact uh, theme here as the Allen NLP presentation was before us. Oh, oh, oh um, Riley, yeah. Okay, awesome. And I am joined today by Christina, who is also working on this project with me. Um, so we are working on a project called Buri, uh, Christina and I are. And uh, essentially the goal of this, this project is to make sleep scoring more accessible to other people. Um, so sleep scoring is a really important step in a sleep study process where uh, a doctor or a, a professional is able to look through the actual EEG data, so the actual like brain waves from the electrodes that are like hooked up to your brain while you sleep. And they're able to um, manually figure out like what stage of sleep you're in at what point, how long you're in different stages of sleep, um, and uh, any any artifacts or anything um, like that, or, or any uh, like sleep spindles or K-complexes or anything like that. 
Um, and so that's actually a really useful step for uh, determining when someone may have a sleep disorder. disorder. Um, so this is a very common step when you um, are getting diagnosed with sleep apnea, for example, you have to go through a sleep study um, and they're able to look at um, these artifacts that may indicate uh, when you woke up for a second or something like that. Um, but it's also a really uh, excellent early warning system for detecting things like Alzheimer's and dementia, because ultimately there's a very strong relationship between sleep and memory. And so when you're sleeping, that's usually when you're forming these memories. Um, so if there's something wrong with your sleep, that's usually um, an indication that you may have these, uh, these memory issues coming up on the horizon very soon as well. Um, so it's a really important uh, step that, that more people should have access to. But unfortunately, it's hard to find a qualified doctor who's able to do that. Um, and also because of how much data is produced by this EEG, well, it's hooked up to your head while you sleep for eight hours. Uh, you know, they have to go through and, and tag this data, eight hours of data at a time, um, which takes a really long time. Uh, and so because of that, it's um, a lot more difficult for people to get um, uh, these sleep studies and, and get their sleep scored um, because you know, it's it's hard to find these doctors. They're expensive. It, it takes a long time to tag this data. And so it's it's um, an issue of cost and availability here. And so our goal is to develop a set of tools uh, that lower that barrier of entry and make it a little bit easier. They take some of that work off of the doctor and they try to um, automate the process a little bit more. Um, so we talked a little bit about our project and the project structure during the interim report. And I just kind of want to rehash a lot of those things. We have a public GitHub repository that we're using to um, manage all of our code. And that also comes along with an issue tracker and a discussion forum. So that discussion forum is where we're posting our blog posts. Um, and then we also use the uh, contributor covenant, if I remember correctly, as a, a, a contributor guideline. Um, we didn't necessarily feel that a website was going to be the most applicable to our project. And so we've kind of foregone that step. Um, but we do have all of our code hosted in a place where everyone can access it. And we do have it uh, licensed under an OSI approved license. Uh, and then I'll let Christina talk a little bit more about this picture here. Um, we just wanted to include an example of what the EEG data we're dealing with looks like. So um, just to rehash what an EEG is, it's this test that's run where a net is put over your head and to that net is connected little ele electrodes. And those electrodes have channels that go to the EEG machine. So on the left of the graph, you'll see those labels that are all overlapping are actually different channels. And the signals that you see going out are the recordings from the EEG. So what we're looking for is to identify in between all these waves and these different channels where the specific sleep spindles or K complexes or like the specified waves are. And you can see at the bottom, it indicates the channel, the time and the value. And we're, those are the parameters that are we're using that are then passed into the algorithm to find these waves within this data. And really this data spans like a total of eight hours. So this is really just a little snippet. Um, we just wanted to give you an idea of what the GUI looks like and what the data looks like. Yeah, and I actually, um opened up the, the program right before this presentation. So you should be able to see a more interactive um, version of this as well, where we're hopping between um, different time frame, different uh, time periods. Um, and we can see like right here, um, we're a ways into, into the sleep. This person is probably asleep by now. Uh, and we see a regular pattern. But when uh, when we were talking about these, these artifacts and, um, and other features in the sleep, we can see sometimes like in here, um, that regular pattern gets broken up. And so that's what our algorithm is designed to detect is those irregularities in the sleep. And then um, when those patterns shift. Uh, 
Um, so yeah, uh, in terms of contributions, we're kind of trying to list the things that we have done since the interim release. Uh, and since then, we have used the, the built-in EEG lab pop interface um, to handle uh, actually like configuring the the setup like you're actually uh, like getting the configuration uh, variables that we need to run this algorithm um, and then we've also worked a little bit on that um, signal processing pipeline so how we're actually going to be um, taking those waveforms and getting those into um, like concrete sleep stages or concrete um, detections of, of different um, artifacts or features or anything like that. Um, unfortunately, because uh, that automated detection is a little bit more complicated, that, that signal processing pass is a little bit more complicated, we don't have something where we can just click a button just yet and just have the algorithm tell you, oh, this is um, where you're forming memories, this is where these sleep spindles occur, this is when you're in this stage of sleep, etc. But we've laid out a lot of the groundwork, and hopefully we're going to be making a big push to get as much of that um, done as we as we can. Um, and then we've also done a little bit more research into um, more advanced automation techniques. So I was reading a really interesting paper the other day about um, different uh, applications of neural networks to this, because obviously when you're looking for patterns in eight hours of data, uh, that's a really great um, use case for this. And so that's something that we want to be looking into. But unfortunately, with our resources, it's hard to get um, good training data for something like that. It's hard to get something that's already pre-tagged for us to be working off of. And then I'll let Christina talk about some of the things that she specifically has been working on as well. Um, that's a good note that something that was really unexpected about this project is that the data sets that were sleep scored, which we needed to, to train the program that we're working on, they're actually not super available because the data sets are hard to obtain, like just in a lab, because they require so much effort to go through eight hours of data and tag the different sleep stages. Because of that, they're often not open source. So most of the existing data sets that are actually available are hard to find and but out of like 500 data sets really only two have been available for us to use 500 data sets on that are known to be open source and available for use so that took up a decent amount of time i'm um, just finding the data that we needed um we're also creating the signal processing pipeline which is the bulk of what we're doing um and i came in not really knowing anything about matlab or the techniques that were going to be used for signal processing so i've been writing notes on filtering bend waves and ffts and writing uh example files and i've been creating a file that produces the statistics for a given data set and right now um, i'm pretty satisfied with this beginning stages of where it's at um, but yeah, we're mostly just going through and, find, and finding the techniques that will work for the specific data sets that we found. Okay, awesome. Uh, so that kind of brings us into some of those issues that we've been running into. And it turns out this is a complex project. So there have been a lot of those issues, plenty of those issues. Um, I think the, the first thing that we kind of knew about going into this was uh, we were going to have to spend a lot of time researching to understand what the current um, techniques looked like and what um, what sorts of things we needed to be looking for in order to, in order to algorithmically detect any anything meaningful in this data set. Um, and then another thing that I don't think either of us had really necessarily considered was a lot of the tools that are out there already um, are written by some really incredible neuroscientists, some really incredible uh, people who are, are, you know, experts in their field when it comes to analyzing this data by hand. Um, but because they aren't necessarily um, trained software engineers, 
some of the uh, software projects that we're trying to work with um, can be a little bit tricky to interface with at times. Um, actually, kind of a funny tangent about that. The other week, uh, I was trying to do something in the uh, EEG Lab API, and I couldn't figure out why my code wasn't working. And I realized that a function name had been misspelled, not in my code, but actually in the API um, where uh, we were expected to call it. Um, so that was kind of a, an interesting experience of, of how um, the software was not necessarily where we were expecting it to be. Um, and then also, on a similar note, because um, so many of these frameworks are written in MATLAB, and that's not something that we really um, have had a lot of experience with, we've had to spend a little bit more time uh, trying to uh, like just understand the language that we're working in uh, than, than I think either of us were expecting either. And then finally, uh, the last big issue, uh, Christina alluded, alluded to this a little bit before, but it's hard to find um, good data sets to work with. Um, and especially when we factor in the different file formats that that EEG data can be in. Uh, so yeah, does anyone have any questions? Uh, it's looking like Prasant is asking if we've made a PR. We haven't actually made a PR uh, quite yet. I'm still not certain if uh, if there was a reason for this misspelling, if there was some sort of technical nomenclature that I'm just not familiar with. Um, but assuming I can't find anything, I'll definitely make up here about that. Yeah, so that's, um, so just to, to expand on it, that's, there's a couple of things here where um, we're getting into a project is, you know, can raise issues, right? Um, so one, it's great that you're, you're going out and attacking another field. Almost any field right now um, needs to, uh, you know, needs to work with computer science. So that's one of the reasons we're, there's so many of us and so much in demand is because you can't do neuroscience without computer science anymore. Um, so, you know, good job. Um, we, we tend to be the ones that, that, you know, they'll learn our stuff piecemeal and then we have to be the ones that, that kind of go in and, and learn their stuff back so that, so that we, we can all talk on the same, on the same level. Um, so that was just a comment. One of the, the questions I'm, I'm, I have for you guys is so there's a limited number of data sets based on uh, and the limited there's multiple file formats and limited data sets am I understanding that correctly yeah exactly have you thought about you know it seems to me like in that situation uh, um, a utility that allows you to convert between formats might be an excellent open source contribution um, it would expand for any given file type the number of files that would be uh, available, you, you know? Yeah, I think that's a that's an excellent idea. Um, I think that's something that, because we weren't really aware of this challenge yeah. when we were going into this project, uh, we hadn't really budgeted our time uh, to be working on something like that. But I think you're absolutely right that that's something that would be amazing to write in the future. Yeah, and that, you know, those types of things, you know, I'm more guilty than you guys are in general. But I rarely, you know, I just kind of get over it. I, I've, you know, look for more data or, you know, ad hoc it. Um, but, you know, from the, from the standpoint of being a lazy programmer, um, and, and good programmers are lazy, right? Um, lo looking, for those, looking for those types of things where you can take and make, you know, really the technical challenge there might be relatively low. Um, you know, the, the, the technical challenge versus uh, utility could be relatively high. I mean, you, you know, or, or, or you know, utility versus technical challenge could be very could be very high for something like that. So it's important when you're going into these fields to go into it with the mindset that if I were doing this from scratch, what would really make my life easier? Um, and I think you guys are, I'm not faulting what you've done. You, you guys are coming in at the beginning stages and these are the questions that are coming up and, and you're right at the right part of what you're doing. Um, but you know, going forward, if you want to continue this, it seems to me like there's an awful lot of places where where you guys could make um, significant contributions. Yeah, absolutely. I think we definitely hit the gold mine in terms of that. Yeah. You'd be surprised at how many of these gold mines uh, exist out there, I think, sometimes. Um, one last comment I'm going to make. 
Uh, so you mentioned that that you know you you find a mistake in their code or, or trying to figure out um, you know all the stuff, all the code that's written because it's written by non-software people, um, and you're also dealing with FFTs and, and signals. So I'm going to tell. I once spent eight hours. Uh, a systems guy had written a piece of software in Fortran, and I spent about eight hours trying to figure out what it did, and. You know, if, if you've if you've done signal processing, there's something called a local oscillator, um, which you use. You can multiply it by uh, uh, a, a given signal to upshift or downshift the frequency. It took me eight hours to figure out that all that code was doing was generating two sine waves and or generating one sine wave at a local oscillation frequency and multiplying it by a by a source sine wave. So. Um, you know, I'd been working in signal processing for a long time by that point. So don't be, uh, don't be discouraged by having to look very hard at some of this code. It can be horribly, horribly written. I think that one loop had like seven go-tos, um, some of which went up to the start and some of which went out of the end. Um, so uh, just keep, keep fighting the good fight. Oh, geez. We luckily do not have it uh, quite that bad. I haven't had to spend eight hours yeah. looking well, at anything quite yet. Give it time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, any, any other questions? We are right about on time. Uh, Ayush is uh, asking, are you looking to write your own neural net to test uh, with some time in the future? Oh, gotcha. Uh, that's an interesting question. I think that's Another one of those things that falls into the category of something that we would love to do, but may not necessarily have time to do that within the scope of this class. Yeah. Um, I think the research that we were able to find on uh, using more advanced uh, machine learning techniques to detect this stuff came uh, fairly late. Uh, and so we had already kind of thought a little bit about some more naive approaches. So I think our strategy is to just kind of get something basic working and then go from there. One interesting thing kind of on this, um, Ayush says they've written one and it's a pretty complicated thing. Um, so one thing that, that can come out of something like this is if you guys continue working in this field, it would be interesting to see if you can get a collaboration going with one of these neuroscientists. Um, you know, yeah, that, absolutely. Because getting their expertise and, uh, and, you know, combined with with your with your field knowledge, particularly once you've you've studied the field a little bit more, could be could be a, an excellent an excellent uh, way to work together. All right, um, we are done. One minute late, and it could have been less if I wouldn't have uh, kept talking. So we'll catch you all on Tuesday. Uh, we have another group of people going on Tuesday. Please check uh, if you are one. It's uh, that is not it. Well, it's in our repository, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to count on you to actually find it. Um, you should know who you are. We're right on schedule. Um, please be ready for Tuesday. Um, let's see. It's uh, Sanfat, Shaif, Eifer, Zakak, Yang B7, and Zamanj. At least that's my pronunciation of your RCS IDs. All right, we'll see you guys later. Thank you. Good presentations today. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see you all in a couple of days. And for anybody hanging out here, I am about to relaunch into the prologue for this class that I forgot to tape. Um, so if you see me going back, and starting over, I am not going insane. I am just uh, reprising an excellently done introduction.